Good evening, comrades, uh, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in. My name is Carl Wood. Uh, I'm the presenter for uh, this uh, this session tonight, and um, uh, we're going to be delving into something that's really central to Marxism, which is political economy. I'm going to uh, try to give a little background on why we study political economy and what its importance is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that before we really dig into the substance of the presentation. Uh, as, uh, as most people probably know, Marxism covers a lot of territory. Uh, in, his, in his essay uh, on the three sources and three component parts of Marxism, Lenin identified uh, three areas. One was philosophy, another was uh, economics, and the third was uh, socialism. And in terms of uh, what Marx's own approach was, he was trained as a philosopher. Uh, he, that's what he got his doctorate in. And of course, he was an organizer for socialism and for pulling the working class together. But he spent most of his life focusing on political economy. And while he published thousands and thousands of pages of, uh, of work. His, the real central part of his life's work was uh, the three volume book Capital, of which he completed the first volume in his lifetime. The second two volumes were uh, completed uh, and filled out by uh, his collaborator, Frederick Engels. And what we're going to be getting into is uh, obviously something as, as comprehensive and as broad as, uh, as this, the area of political economy and Marxism, uh, it's not possible to cover that in one session of an hour and a half, or for that matter, two sessions of an hour and a half, if you count the second session we're doing this week. Uh, but I want to hit a couple of key concepts. So um, I'm going to wait just a couple of minutes so that attendees can arrive and get ready for the formal presentation. Um, and then we'll delve into it. While we're waiting, um, let me give a little bit of my own background. Uh, I'm an old guy, I'm 75 years old, uh, and I've been in the movement really all of my life. My parents met through the Communist Party, and so I'm a classic red diaper baby. Uh, but being born into the movement doesn't make you part of it. Uh, that's a choice that each of us has to make. And I chose uh, in my early uh, adulthood or late teenagerhood, I guess, uh, that I would be part of this movement. And I've been active in, uh, in, in the politics of working for a transition to socialism my entire uh, adolescent and adult life. I've worked for about 10 years in steel mills as a, uh, and, and became an industrial electrician. And after uh, my job went away in that industry and uh, much of the steel industry went belly up in this country, uh, I was fortunately able to get into another industry, into the electrical uh, generation industry, where I became uh, not just a union member, but an active trade unionist, uh, head of a 2000 member local for about a dozen years, and the member of the national executive board of my union. Uh, since then, I've worked, uh, I've actually served as a, uh, a state official for about six years and uh, in the utility area, and uh, also uh, worked until my retirement a few years ago as a staff representative for the Utility Workers Union. So a lot of the focus of my activity in my lifetime has been around the trade union movement, although I've also uh, been very active in struggles for equality uh, and struggles for peace and other areas of progressive social activity. Uh, with that introduction, let's uh, start into the subjects of the presentation tonight. First of all, why do we study Marxist political economy? Well, uh, 
we live in a society in which social injustice is the rule. It's not the exception. Uh, in our capitalist economy, the idea of equality, while it's a legal uh, doctrine, uh, it's really a sham. A tiny fraction of the po population, the super rich, control and own the great majority of productive assets. Uh, in this context, there are two uh, what are considered official or uh, acceptable alternatives in the political realm. One is conservatism, which uh, holds that people exerve, uh, exist to serve the market economy, and liberalism, including social democracy or what's called moderate socialism, which seeks to improve things gradually, but within the capitalist system. Both of these approaches accept inequality and injustice as normal and inevitable. Uh, that's a reality that Marx recognized. And, uh, and before Marx recognized it, it's probably something that lots of workers understood. And the working class needs its own alternative. And that's what Marx's great contribution was, is to present the working class with a scientifically based alternative for structuring the economy and the rest of society. So what is Marxist political economy? The a formal definition is that political economy is the study of relations between people in the process of production and exchange. Uh, capitalist economists uh, treat it as if uh, the uh, political economy was a study of what happens with goods and services, how they're traded, what happens with money. And Marx recognized that at the bottom of all of that was the relations between people in the process of production and exchange. Now, Marx wasn't the first one to come up with a lot of these ideas because as capitalism came to dominate the economy of the first great capitalist power, that was Great Britain, uh, economists like, Dave, like Adam Smith and after him, David Ricardo, uh, sought to understand and explain the workings of this new system. Uh, they wanted to understand that they weren't opposed to it. They wanted to understand it and make it work better. Uh, although they supported capitalism, they introduced the idea that labor is the source of all new value. Um, so that isn't something that Karl Marx invented. That's an idea that was uh, developed by capitalist economists, uh, notably Adam Smith and David Ricardo. And actually, by the middle of the 19th century, it was pretty universally accepted. Uh, in society, that uh, there's a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln uh, explicitly recognizing that labor is the source of all value. And so even among a, you know, a bourgeois, a, a progressive, but bourgeois politician like, uh, like Abraham Lincoln, uh, the importance of labor in the development of the economy was recognized. And so in the context of the political upheaval spearheaded by the rapidly growing working class, because the middle of the 19th century saw this tremendous growth of industry, and along with that, the people who worked in industry, the working class, and Karl Marx and Frederick Engels built on the foundation of these bourgeois thinkers to create a truly scientific theory of economics in the service of the working class. Um, so. Uh, Ricardo and Adam Smith uh, weren't really working on behalf of the working class. They were trying to explain, th explain their own system to the capitalists themselves. Marx and Engels worked to build a, uh, a intellectual foundation that the working class could use to promote its own liberation. Uh, now, um, since, uh, as I said, by around the middle of the 19th century, the idea that labor was the source of all value uh, was widely accepted. But as uh, capitalism became more mature, 
and especially as the working class started getting organizing and uh, and started presenting the possibility of alternatives to capitalism. Uh, capitalist economists recognized that the recognition of the labor theory of value was a real challenge to the legitimacy of capitalism because it implies that uh, value is being produced by one group of people and taken away and, uh, and secured for their own use by another group of people. And so capitalist economics and capitalist economists came to become uh, a conscious instrument of the exploiting uh, class in its attack against the workers. And uh, Victor Perlo, who was a Communist Party uh, member and, uh, and a, a great economist, an American economist, uh, made the statement that capitalist economics has become the conscious instrument of the exploiting class in its attack against the workers. It provides theories, so-called, to support capitalist positions in opposition to the workers' demands. Well, that's a communist viewpoint. What do the capitalists have to say about that? Well, actually, you don't hear very many of them acknowledging that uh, that's what's going on. But many of you perhaps uh, have heard of the famous uh, University of Chicago School of Economics, which is perhaps the leading uh, economic think tank uh, for uh, especially the conservative part of the bourgeoisie in the United States. and. Uh, at the time of its founding, the first president of the University of Chicago once remarked, it's all very well to sympathize with the working man, but we got our money from the other side and we can't afford to offend them. So I think, you know, sometimes uh, hearing it from the horse's mouth really reveals a lot. And uh, that comment to me is tremendously revealing. So during this class, uh, we're going to go through a lot of different things, but I would hope that people will come away with really three basic takeaways. And so um, if you can try to maybe kind of keep this in mind while we're going through this, um, and then I'll review it at the end. Uh, I don't expect, nobody could expect everybody to remember everything that happens in this class. But these are three very important concepts that are pretty central to the understanding of Marxist economics. First of all, what is a commodity? And second, uh, what is the cycle of capitalist production? And third, what is exploitation? So uh, these are th three things that I would like to give some attention to and come back to them at the end. Let's start with what capitalism is. Um, most of us know the uh, what I think has now become generally accepted through society, although it wasn't always accepted this way, but that society, uh, since the evolution of the human race uh, and the development of human societies uh, beyond the tribal stage, uh, there have been different forms of organization of human society. And we generally recognize that there was a period of widespread uh, slavery that uh, resulted from groups of people conquering other groups of people and then the establishment of, of monarchies or empires on the basis of that. Uh, that was succeeded by the development of feudalism and out of feudalism came capitalism. And uh, I think it's pretty widely accepted that that is the order in which human history has evolved since the development of the first class societies. Um, capitalism is, uh, is a historically evolved stage of human society, and it's characterized by, first of all, concentration of wealth in the hands of a few people who own the means of production. Now, what, what are the means of production? Uh, the means of production uh, can be uh, land, they can be tools and implements. In, uh, in the modern world, uh, in uh, the 21st century, uh, they can also include things like software. And uh, 
uh, as well as all sorts of advanced technological processes. Um, the, uh, this, these means of production uh, are concentrated in the hands of just a few people. And as time has gone on, it seemed like in the late 19th century, uh, when we had the robber barons and, and industrialists like uh, Andrew Carnegie and, uh, and financiers like J.P. Morgan, that there was tremendous concentration of wealth. But in today's world, the uh, concentration is maybe a thousand times greater than that. Instead of millionaires and multimillionaires, we have multi-billionaires. And, uh, and it's not just the reduced value of each dollar that uh, has created this, this concentration. It's the fact that the amount of wealth is greatly in increased because of the tremendous productivity of modern society and modern technology. In this society, the great majority of the population has no means of getting, getting their living except by selling their power, their ability to work for wages. And uh, probably almost everybody on this, uh, on this session tonight, on this call, falls into that category. Marx called this class of propertyless workers the proletariat. Uh, which is derived from a Latin word referring to the uh, uh, to the free citizens of Rome who didn't own any property. Uh, today we call it the working class, and uh, it's probably not a good idea to use proletariat all the time because most ordinary people don't know what it means. Uh, the working class uh, people have an idea what that means, although perhaps the way we define the working class is different from the way the bourgeoisie. Uh, and bourgeois media describe it. Um, and in this society, virtually all production is for exchange. Uh, that is for sale in the market, not for the personal use of the producers. Um, this contrasts, for example, to a lot of production, say, under feudalism, where serfs and farmers uh, produced a lot of, uh, a lot of what they produced was for their own use, or it was for use on the uh, manner on which they lived uh, didn't really enter into the market. It never made it to the marketplace. So that uh, a village might have um, a few things that were exchanged. Maybe a shoemaker would make shoes or uh, um, a blacksmith would make horseshoes. But for the most part, goods were produced for the personal use of the producers or within their uh, immediate family or community. Under capitalism, goods are produced for exchange uh, and they're called commodities. Um, we'll get in a second to what a commodity is. <clears throat> uh, the reason that we focus and one of why I identified one of the uh, takeaways from the session would be what is a commodity? <clears throat> Excuse me. is that the commodity itself is really central to the capitalist mode of production. The quote here from Karl Marx, uh, the wealth of those societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of, the com of commodities, its unit being a single commodity. So in order to understand the capitalist mode of production, we have to understand what a commodity is. And Marx approached this in a very scientific way. He defined a commodity as having three qualities. First of all, it has a use value. That is, it must satisfy some human want. Now, there's a lot of kinds of wants. Uh, it might be something that is needed for the sustenance of life, food, for example. Uh, it might be something that is uh, desirable or useful uh, for aesthetic purposes. Uh, jewelry is an example of that. Um, it, uh, art might be another one. Most commodities are things that are actually used to satisfy some physical or uh, emotional need of people. And uh, so having a use value is one of the qualities of commodity. 
if a commodity doesn't have any use value, if it's not useful for anybody, then it can't be a commodity. Second, it's a product of human labor. There are things that are useful, um, but are not products of human labor. Um, if uh, sunshine is useful, and uh, but sunshine is not produced by human beings. Uh, water is useful, but except, uh, I guess, in modern society, uh, water has to be treated so it's potable. Uh, so there's human labor involved in that. But uh, free-flowing water that occurs in mountain streams, for example, uh, it's, it's a product of, na of, of nature, but not of human labor. And third, it's produced for exchange, so that a product that is produced for personal or domestic or family use of the producer is not a commodity. So that, for example, uh, a, a peasant farmer who uh, raises food for his or her family, uh, but is not taking that food to market, that isn't the purpose of raising it, uh, they're not producing uh, that food as commodities. They're producing it for other purposes. So these are the three key things, uh, that it's useful, that it's a product of human labor, and that it's produced for exchange. And ultimately, the exchange value, uh, which uh, Marx referred to generally as this value of a commodity is determined by the uh, amount of labor that it's necessary for its production. And he used the term socially necessary labor to distinguish or, or to indicate that uh, for the production of a given commodity, uh, some producers might be more efficient, some might be less efficient, and so they might require more or less time to produce that commodity. But the average time uh, within a given society, within a given technology uh, that is necessary is the socially necessary labor time required for its production. Long before the emergence of modern capitalism, merchant capitalists who were not involved in the production process made profits by buying and selling commodities, often transporting them from areas of abundance to areas of scarcity. Uh, think Marco Polo, uh, an Italian uh, merchant who traveled to uh, East Asia and bought commodities there and transported them back to Europe and sold them for a much higher price, then took uh, that money, bought uh, commodities in Europe, transported them to Asia, and sold them again. Uh, there was no production that was involved in this. It was just buying and selling, trading. Uh, a lot of these uh, merchant capitalists were also pirates on the side, so there was a lot of theft involved. Um, that's uh, <laughs> part of the uh, the genealogy of capitalism uh, it goes back to piracy. But these were not productive capitalists, these were merchant capitalists. And under, uh, and that kind of merchant capitalism existed before modern capitalism uh, really existed. Modern capitalism emerged probably in the uh, early 17th century, uh, maybe the late 16th century. And uh, um, but there were merchant capitalists going back far before then. Uh, under capitalism, though, new value is created in the process of production, not through exchange, so that Marco Polo might buy spices in Asia and bring them to Italy and sell them and sell them at much higher prices. Uh, he wasn't, the new value wasn't created by any production process. It was just created by buying where it's scarce and selling where it's or buying where it's, it's uh, abundant and cheap and selling where it's scarce and expensive. Uh, under capitalism, new value is created in the process of production, not through exchange. So buying low, selling high is not the way primarily that capitalists make their money. So, uh, so we've indicated what is a commodity and now we're going to talk about the second 
what I hope will be a takeaway from this class, uh, which is the cycle of capitalist production, how production takes place under capitalism. And there's a formula that we use here. And uh, I'm going to go through each of the uh, each of the letters in it and try to explain what they mean. The first, the capitalist starts out with money. And that's the first M in that equation. Uh, money is the cat is the mo that's the money that the capitalist invests in production. And that money may be spent, for example, on uh, land, on factories, on equipment, on raw materials, and on, uh, uh, and of course, on the use of workers or labor power. Then, in the uh, those are the different commodities that the capitalist buys with that money. So, from money, we go to see or, or commodities. Those go into the production process. So that let's take since I used to work in the steel and industry, I like to use that as an example. Uh, the capitalist has bought a steel mill, has bought machinery for the steel mill and buildings for the steel mill, raw materials, iron ore, uh, coal to make coke out of, uh, limestone, and uh, natural gas to fuel the ovens. And of course, the capitalist has hired workers. So all of those are commodities uh, that are produced or that are used in the production process. Uh, the workers are not generally literally used up, their labor power is used. And although tragically, sometimes they're physically used up as well. Uh, and out of this comes a new commodity. Uh, in the steel mill, the new commodity is steel in various forms, uh, maybe, uh, sheet metal or uh, or ingots or uh, whatever form it's, uh, will be sold on the market. And then those new commodities that are sold on the market produce a new amount of money, which uh, if the capitalist is to stay in business is going to have to be more money than what the capitalist started with. So M prime here uh, becomes a new amount of money. So that's that's the process or the production cycle under capitalism. Money is used to buy commodities for production, which enter into the production process, uh, producing new commodities, and those are sold for a new and presumably higher amount of money. And new value is created in the production process. Uh, it's not uh, you know, if, if all a capitalist does is buy some things cheap and sell them expensive, nothing is produced, nothing new comes out of it. Uh, the source of all real new wealth in the capitalist economy is the production process. And the different commodities with which this process begins, they may include raw materials, equipment and machinery, land and buildings. Uh, all these are called constant capital because by themselves, they can't create a new commodity with a value greater than their own value. So if you buy uh, a, a big pile of iron ore and you have a factory and you buy a lot of coking coal and natural gas, uh, they can't create any new commodity with a value greater than their own value. The only thing that can transform them into something with greater value is the application of labor power, which is then called variable capital because it varies uh, or increases the value of the commodity that's produced. So the employer hires workers, in other words, buys their labor power, and the labor that they add to the production process creates the new value. However, the pay the workers receive for their labor power is only a fraction of the new value created by their labor. The rest of this newly created value goes, for example, um, to owner's profits, of course, uh, to, uh, and that can include the inflation of stock prices. Uh, 
very common a phenomenon now is buying a company buying back its own stock. That's a way of driving up stock prices so that uh, the increase in the owner's value doesn't show up in direct in profits, but if they go to sell their stock, the price of the stock has gone up, so they make their money that way. Uh, commercial costs, such as advertising, sales commissions, uh, political lobbying, uh, all those are part of, uh, get a section of that newly created value. And then, of course, uh, excessive compensation to top management. We all know the notorious CEO salaries that we're seeing today, but it's not just CEOs. It's uh, it's other corporate officers, vice presidents, and corporate uh, uh, executives of various descriptions. Um, also, uh, capitalist companies, corporations, uh, may have to borrow money in order to function, so they have to pay interest on their bonds and on their bank loans. And then a whole other area, which is becoming increasingly important, uh, rent has been around for a long time, uh, where a capitalist might have to pay rent on the land or the building that, the, uh, uh, that was on that land. But Today, we also see the use of licensing for various technologies and patent fees. And what's characteristic of all of these things, rent, license, and patent fees, is in themselves, they don't contribute anything to the production process, um, but uh, they're like a, a blood-sucking leech on the, uh, on the system. And of course, the people who own the, uh, who are the renters or the uh, people who own the licenses and own the patents don't look at themselves as leeches, but in fact, they are. They don't contribute anything to the, uh, uh, to the production process itself. But if we add all of these things together, uh, they're called surplus value. And Marx used the, uh, the, the letter small s to uh, represent surplus value. And in most US industries, total surplus value uh, is at least three or four times of total wages. In other words, even though labor produces all value, workers receive only 25% or less of what they produce. Uh, let's talk a little bit about profit. Now, um, I just said that uh, workers only end up with, uh, what, less than a quarter of what they produce. So, and if the rest is going to profit, why do businesses claim that their rates of profit are so much lower than 75 or 80%? Well, there's two reasons. First, they only include the part of the surplus value uh, that uh, the owners or the shareholders profits in the equation. Um, parts of that surplus value go to other capitalists besides the person or business or uh, stockholder who actually owns the stock or the business in question. Uh, so when you go into wage negotiations, um, if you're fortunate enough to have a union and can actually go into wage negotiations, uh, the negotiator for the company will say, we can't afford to give you what you're demanding because we're only making a 10% rate of profit. Well, actually, uh, and, and so you wonder, well, why is it that uh, we just saw that, uh, that the rate of profits are 75 or 80%? Well, it's because those profits end up being shared not only with the uh, supposed owner of the business, but with banks, landlords, patent owners, and corporate officers who are also all getting rich from the value added by the workers' labor. Um, so in contrast, you know, we were just looking at what is the rate of profit. That's what we were just talking about. Uh, in contrast, Marxists use a different term. Well, they use an additional term. Uh, we recognize the, the usefulness of the term rate of profit. But Marxists also talk about the rate of exploitation. Uh, and so bear with me while I walk you through these uh, little equations here. The rate of profit is equal to the surplus value, that is the extra value that is added by the, uh, uh, by the workers, divided by the constant capital 
uh, that is the business, buildings, the land, the raw materials, machinery, and so forth, plus the variable capital, that is the wages. So it's the additional value divided by the constant capital plus the variable capital. And then you multiply it by 100% and you get a percentage as a rate of profit. Uh, but to understand the level of exploitation involved in capitalist production, a more useful formula is not the rate of profit, but the rate of surplus value, which is also called the rate of exploitation. And we use a different formula for that. The rate of surplus value is the surplus value, that is the additional value that is added by the, uh, by the production process uh, times 100%. Uh, divided by variable capital or wages. So, um, and what this produces is a uh, is something that we call the rate of exploitation. Now, we all are familiar with the use of the term exploitation. Uh, somebody who has a lousy job, you know, they work at a fast food restaurant and uh, are trying to get by on if they're lucky, $15, $16 an hour, uh, and they'll say, I feel really exploited. Well, they are, but they're not talking about this formula. They're talking about uh, the general condition of their life and how they're not getting paid very much. By contrast, another worker who is, say, making, uh, who is in a highly technical or highly skilled or capital-intensive industry, uh, I used to work in a nuclear power plant, and the capital investment per worker in that plant was about three or four million dollars for each of us workers. Well, um, we got paid pretty well. Uh, there were power plant operators that were back in, this is back in the uh, late 80s, were making 125, 150 thousand dollars a year. Uh, they didn't refer to themselves as being exploited, but in fact, by uh, using this formula, because the uh, the amount of value that they were creating was so huge for a very small number of workers because of the capital intensive nature of the industry, their rate of exploitation was actually much higher than that of the person who was working at Burger King. Um, so to Marxists, exploitation is not just a quality, you don't just say I feel oppressed because I'm a you know it's a form of oppression, but it's also a quantity, it's an amount, and so a worker who is producing uh, ten times more than they are getting paid is more exploited than a more poorly paid worker who is producing say three times what they're getting paid. Uh, so this is an important concept, I think, because it expresses the degree of exploitation under capitalism. So let's, uh, let's kind of look, uh, I made up this example uh, to reveal the difference between using the term rate of profit and the term rate of exploitation. Uh, for this uh, hypothetical business that I've invented here, the uh, the surplus value that is created uh, is a half million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars, and the uh, capital investment is, uh, or the amount of of constant capital that's used up is four million dollars, and then the wages are two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. And with that, with those numbers, we end up with a rate of profit, which is what the capitalists will acknowledge and we'll talk about, uh, of just under 12%. Um, but if we use those same numbers and just look at the comparison of the, uh, uh, of, of the new product that is produced, uh, the surplus value that is produced in the new product, divided by the variable capital or the wages, we end up with a rate of exploitation of 200%. And so the capitalist says, I'm only make, I'm barely making 12% return. And the Marxist worker says, yeah, but you're exploiting us to the tune of 200%. Um, 
Now, uh, in his book, Super Profits and Crises, uh, Marxist uh, economist Victor Perlow, uh, who's passed away now, but uh, leaves a tremendous amount of wisdom in the pages of his books, uh, quote some ads that were taken out by state governments and business journals, which uh, were not read, I'm sure, by too many workers. Uh, one quote is, uh, this is from the state of New Jersey. Uh, they're, uh, they're trying to get new investment in their state. So they say, profit, you can profit from the highest worker productivity of any industrialized state in America. Value added per dollar of, va of wages is a hefty $3.76 versus the national average of $3.36. That's the only measure of labor cost that matters. What really matters is how much value was added to your raw materials or component parts by those workers during the manufacturing process. Uh, <laughs> that, that really sounds like a Marxist analysis, but uh, it wasn't intended for workers to be reading. Um, State of New York, uh, around the same time, published an ad that said New York's manufacturing workers produce $4.25 in value added for every dollar of wages. So um, when they're talking to each other and not talking for the general public, uh, sometimes we see some revelation of the reality that exists. What they're really talking about here, these numbers, this is the rate of exploitation. They don't call it that, but we do. Uh, so for every dollar that you get paid in New York, uh, $4.25 is being stolen by the, by the owner. Uh, Perlo also calculated the rate of exploitation in the United States during the post-World War II period using official US government statistics. Um, starting 1946, he came up with about 76%. Uh, every year, or every couple of years, it increased. Uh, the last year that he calculated in this particular book, it was up to 129% was the rate of exploitation. And that's with an inflation adjustment. Uh, so this isn't produced just by inflation. Um, I used the same methodology and calculated recent levels of exploitation. Uh, I did that a couple of years ago, about three, four years ago, and came up with a, a level of 240% uh, rate of uh, exploitation. So that it, that's, you know, uh, different ways of working these numbers produce somewhat different results. But one way or the other, we find that the capitalists uh, hold back quite a large amount of the new value that is created through the production process. It doesn't end up in the pockets of workers. So anyway, we've gone through these basic concepts and uh, hopefully I've helped you to understand them if you didn't already. Uh, what is a commodity? Uh, it's something that satisfies some human want or need and it's a product of human labor, and it has, it's produced for exchange. Uh, the cycle of capitalist production, which we just went through, and then what is exploitation? So that's really the uh, presentation that I have prepared already, and I'm hopeful that uh, we have some comments and questions from people that we can try to address and spend the rest of the session. We're about halfway through, so we have quite a bit of time for your comments and your questions. And uh, I would hope to open the floor to all of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Carl. Uh, the person speaking right now is Kay. I am an organizer in the Queens Club in the New York District and the New York YCL, and I will be moderating for the discussion period. So, you, in order to indicate that you want to speak, you must click on the picture of the hand, and I will be able to see it, um, or should be able to see it, and then open your mic on your end by clicking the picture of the microphone. Then you wait for your name to be called, your mic will be opened up. Yourself, okay. your comment, question. 
Okay, uh, I just changed you to an organizer. So if you could go over the, the process again, it, you cut off just a minute, not oh. even a minute, but just a sec, you know, just if you could go over it again. Sure. Um, so if you want to speak, you will click the picture of the hand to indicate that you want to speak. You will open your mic on your end by clicking the picture of the microphone. Then you'll wait for your name to be called. Your mic will be opened on our end. You'll be asked to speak and briefly introduce your comment or a question. And then we'll close your mic and move on to the next person. And we'll take, let's say, three questions or comments at a time. So I'll call on one person, a second person, a third person, and then we'll allow Carl to respond. And then we'll pick up another three or four and we'll go. Uh, in that way until uh, closing time at, well, in about 45 minutes. So let me see. Here we are. All right. I'll choose uh, Alexis. Are you able to speak? Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Hi. Um, first time doing one of this, so please forgive some nerves here. Um, my question is, how does inflation generally impact the rate of exploitation? I imagine it has some kind of impact on the costs for constant um, commodities and, and variable capital. So just curious if that has any impact at all. Thank you. All right. Next, we'll take Dallas. Oh, hold on. There we are. Dallas, you may speak. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, now we can. All right, so my question is, is how can we use these uh, like formulas and labor agreements to have like smart contracts to fit these variable rates of exploitation? Like, let's say that we could have like uh, the ability to use DLT technology to track the rate of exploitation to better compensate workers uh, in real time. Can you state that question again? I, I kind of didn't follow the first part of it. Uh, Dallas, if you can raise your hand again so I can see it, I can unmute you. Thank you. All right, you may speak. So uh, can you hear me? Yeah. So basically, I'm trying to see how we can use these formulas with modern technology such as DLT and stuff like that to benefit labor unions. Like if we could measure these rates of exploitation in real time using data, we could better help unions uh, compensate their workers. Okay. All right. And last we'll take uh, Taylor. You've been unmuted. Hi there. Um, so understanding that there's these kind of squishy or deceptive or unclear numbers from capitalists, right? I guess kind of building on the previous question, how do we go about calculating these different kinds of rates of exploitation within our own different, in different industries, uh, especially in situations where they may be more removed from like more immediate production? Maybe it's in logistics or maybe it's in retail or even in like education or something. So that's my question. All right, that'll be three questions for now. Carl, you have the floor. Yeah, give me just a second to write down that last question. So. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, all, all real good questions. Thank you. Um, 
first of all, uh, the question from Alexis, how does inflation impact the rate of exploitation? Um, by itself, probably not too much. Um, the, uh, although one thing that, uh, that happens during periods of high inflation, if workers are locked into uh, a certain wage scale, and uh, they are not able, then that's going to lag what uh, is happening in the market is, in general. And so that's going to tend to increase the rate of exploitation because the, uh, the boss will be selling products for a higher amount, will be making more, uh, more money on them, but the wages will lag behind because of the effect of inflation. And um, I'll, I'll give you, uh, you know, from my personal recollection, this goes way back many years, back into the uh, early or the mid, um, I guess the, the, the late 1960s, early 1970s, was a period of very high inflation. And I was working with some other people, uh, other young people like myself, who were trying to organize workers in the uh, mobile home manufacturing industry. Uh, which was uh, big in, uh, in the part of California that I lived in at the time. And they had actually been successful. The Carpenters Union had managed to organize some of these plants and got a four-year or three-year agreement uh, that locked in the wages at a certain level. But it happened during a time that, uh, that inflation really cut loose. It was going crazy, uh, even more than it we're seeing right now today, in large part because of the impact of the Vietnam War on, on prices. And as a result, prices were going up tremendously, but the workers in their contract, the union, was locked into a certain uh, level of compensation. And so they fell behind uh, uh, the rate of inflation in their wages and non-union places were actually able to uh, offer higher wages during those times. And the, uh, as a result of that, it presented a uh, just about an insurmountable barrier to organizing any workers in the industry because people looked at the situation where they had secured a wage agreement in a contract and actually ended up all the worse for it. And that had to do with the effect of inflation because there was no cost of living clauses in the contract. Um, but even without that dynamic going on, uh, wages will tend to lag prices in periods of high inflation. And uh, on the rare occasion that it works the other way, where uh, a shortage of labor, for example, um, results in the workers having something of a, a stronger hand when they are uh, talking to the whether they have a union or not, when they're uh, uh, pursuing wage increases, then the powers that be, the, the official uh, realm of uh, government panics and tries to do something about it. You hear people talk about a wage price spiral, and that's what's going on right now is that because there is a great demand for workers and what uh, under capitalist terms is a labor shortage, there really isn't. I mean, there, there are still people who don't have jobs, but compared to more typical times, it's a much lower rate of unemployment. It's in the threes rather than in the sixes or sevens. And as a result of that, uh, the workers have a little bit of leverage when it comes to getting wages. And that's not acceptable because that's where profits come from is by suppressing wages. So in order to put pressure, downward pressure on uh, wages, you have to create more unemployment. How do you do that? Well, you can raise interest rates like the Federal Reserve has just been doing. And uh, if they're successful, they will create higher unemployment. There will be uh, more competition between workers for the same jobs and less pressure on bosses to provide more wages. And uh, so, you know, we see that while the Federal Reserve is supposed to be concerned both with 
uh, limiting inflation as well as maintaining high employment. Uh, in reality, uh, it's a one-way street. It only uh, applies in one direction. So uh, Dallas's question, um, how do we use these formulas to benefit unions? I think the key thing here is uh, it's a matter of helping workers to understand that uh, they are not getting the full value of what they produce. In fact, they're getting a small fraction of the value of what they produce and that they have to be willing to make demands that are more in line with the value of their labor uh, that they expend. And I think that having that consciousness among workers is what helps to develop militancy within the unions and helps them to fight. So I'm not sure that, uh, that there's a way to use the formulas to benefit the unions directly. It's more a matter of educating workers to what is really going on in their lives and helping them understand that even if they're making what seems like a living wage, in fact, they're being exploited at a very high level. Um, and then Taylor asked the question about how uh, all of this applies in non-productive sectors. Um, in the first place, uh, some of those sectors that we don't really see as part of the production process, in fact, kind of are. And I think that, for example, distribution industries uh, outfits like Amazon um, are, uh, while they may not be producers themselves, the distribution process has been so thoroughly integrated in with the production process that it's pretty hard to draw, draw a bright line there. And so uh, the cost of uh, the cost of distribution, uh, in a lot of ways, gets integrated into the cost of production. Uh, that's um, that. That's a formulation that I'm a little bit nervous about because during Marx's time, Marx uh, made a clean distinction between costs of production uh, and the uh, and and where profits are made and the distribution. And Marx said that profits don't come from uh, or new value is not created in the process of, of distribution. But in fact, I think in the current, in the way the world works today, uh, that distribution is so integra integral to production that it's hard to draw a line between those. Um, there may be other uh, more knowledgeable Marxists than me who might take issue with that, but uh, I, I think that's something worth considering. The other thing, though, that maybe is uh, more generally applicable is that there are uh, uh, there are various uh, areas of the economy that are not really productive, that aren't involved in production and uh, in themselves don't produce surplus value. But what happens is that in modern economy, every aspect of the economy tends to mimic this model, even if it's not itself uh, structured that way. And uh, so, whether you know whatever industry you work in, whatever trade you work in, whatever aspect of the economy you work in, um, you uh, uh, you end up fitting into the economy uh, in a lot of the same ways. So that wage levels tend to be similar across lines of different uh, industries and different sections of industries and, and other areas that are not part of those industries. Um, so why don't we go on to the uh, to the next questions? All right. Just to remind everyone, if you want to speak, please raise your hand. I have some people who were waiting last time, so I'll call on Corina first. You may speak. Uh, yes, uh, I want to I want to thank you, uh, Comrade Carl, uh, for your wonderful presentation and also the book references but i want to ask you how much do that there's also a factor of kind of erosion like an expanse but it may also turn around in so far as how much do the 
capitalist or owners of production figure that there possibly could be taxes and in and it could be even circular because these taxes could be used for the uh, you know m for money for social programs which actually benefit uh, you know the workers to a certain extent like social security medical benefits and so maybe you know by greater taxation there could also be greater benefits on the other end and then there also could be counter productivity because if the workers ask for too much well uh, then the factories or uh, the means of production close down and you'd have more, unemplo more unemployment and, imposs and impossibility and so you would have more poverty so could you ever think of a possibility that workers may even be outpricing themselves that's it All right. Did you get all that, Carl? I did, yeah. All right. Next, we will take Jim. You may speak. Hi. Uh, sorry, I, I don't know if any question like this got asked earlier. My computer mic w uh, wigged out, so now I'm on my phone. Um, but this is more of a question about sort of the evolution of the philosophy of political economy. I've had, I've, I've read Marx, uh, I've read Capital, I've read Adam Smith, I've read a few of these classical political economists, as well as read some of the Chicago boys. Um, and I'm curious if, if in your studies, have you ever encountered, um, I noticed with a lot of the classical political economists, so what we call econ economics now tends to get equated with this uh, very obviously pro business owner or pro capitalist pro uh you know ruling class sort of narrative of, of um economic of economics but i noticed that the classical political economists were much more tightly coupled to sort of a philosophical vision of labor as the source of value and i was wondering if in your studies uh do you know where that kind of break occurred or was there sort of a concerted effort by the um pro capitalist e economists i guess to uh, extirpate the term or you know i guess maybe to bring forward the term political economy as opposed to just uh economy if that makes sense hopefully that makes sense thank you okay We're gonna take right. question. yeah uh we will take a question from christian you may speak. Christian. Uh, can can you hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, okay, so my question is, um, hypothetically, if a central bureaucratic structure were to take control of the means of production on behalf of the people, um, and so basically cut profits out of the equation, that extra $3 that you were talking about earlier, um, do you, you know, in, in your research and stuff, do you have a figure that, um, like an estimated figure of the type of money that would, um, that would bring in if, if profits were cut out of the equation? Like, for example, would that be enough to cover the treasury, cover our debts and stuff like that? And, um, also is, is that type of economy even theoretically possible to where, um, instead of even collecting taxes, you could just sort of raise the prices of commodities or lower the prices based on the needs of the treasury. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, shall, uh, then let me uh, try to address these three uh, questions and then we'll move on to some other ones. Uh, first of all, Karina uh, talked about um, a couple things, but I think the essence of your question was if workers ask for too much, uh, is that something that could itself lead to greater unemployment and be harmful for the workers. And this is actually an idea that was put forward in Marx's time. Uh, and he, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was raised by one of the uh, 
activists in the uh, Working Men's Association that Marx was a, a participant in, uh, who said that we're really just chasing our tail. If we keep trying to drive up wages, all that's going to happen is the capitalists are going to raise prices and uh, we'll never get ahead. We'll never uh, really succeed in, in accomplishing anything. And Marx wrote a, uh, wrote a very influential pamphlet about that called Wage, Labor, and Capital. And that's one of the rec recommended readings for this class and for uh, everybody who uh, thinks they're going to be involved in the working class movement for the rest of your life. Um, I think it's worth spending a little time uh, looking this over because it's something that Marx addressed at that time. And basically he, uh, what he revealed or observed in that is in the first place that workers have to, uh, have to push for decent wages and higher wages because the capitalists are always pushing in the other direction. And if the workers aren't fighting to at least maintain their position, uh, they're just going to fall back more and more and more. So, and uh, he used some colorful language to describe that, but uh, that's uh, that was kind of the essence of that. And history has shown that, in fact, uh, there really aren't any examples of workers pricing themselves out of the market. Uh, because the amount that the capitalists are making in profits is so high compared to what the workers end up with, even under the best circumstances, that uh, that really all that happens is that the level of profits for the capitalists go down somewhat. And as long as we have capitalism, that's going to continue. And uh, there's always the possibility of workers improving their situation by fighting for better conditions, for better wages, for having to work less hours for a living wage. And that's something that uh, we're really required to do, or we're just gonna sink into a form of degradation and hopelessness. Uh, but I, I'd, I'd suggest that uh, everybody take a look at that little book. Um, I don't know if you can, uh, there's a, a volume that uh, includes these two uh, uh, these two pamphlets or speeches that were given by uh, Marx, one called Wage, Labor, and Capital, the other called Value, Price, and Profit. International Publishers publishes them together in one volume. And it's the whole volume is only uh, less than 100 pages, so it's, it's well worth reading. Uh, I'd say it's almost required reading. It's one of those things like the Communist Manifesto that sometime in your life you have to read. Uh, Jim's question, um, where did the break occur from the uh, uh, from what we call uh, a progressive capitalist viewpoint, recognizing the, uh, the fact that all new wealth is created by labor uh, to what we have degenerated to at the present time, which is trying to dismiss the importance of labor in the, in the creation of value. And it really occurred probably in the second half of the uh, 19th century, uh, because as uh, this was a period of time in which there was a lot of working class activity, the working class was starting to become aware of its own potential power. And, you know, the, uh, the revolutions of, of 1849 or 40, 48, 49, that uh, Marx and Engels got involved in politics through. And then the, uh, the periods of working class militancy and activity that followed that, uh, that started also coinciding with the beginnings of the development of monopolistic practices, which hadn't been commonplace in capitalism prior to that. And all those things together uh, tended to uh, create a sense of vulnerability among the capitalists. Uh, they were making loads and loads of money. They were, uh, especially as monopolies started to develop and you had these, uh, uh, these millionaires and uh, and uh, robber barons and so forth, and uh, 
they also saw that uh, it, that you couldn't just take it for granted that the workers would go along with the system the way it was. There were starting to be ch challenges to it. And so uh, that meant that they had to develop an ideology that would justify the exploitation that was going on. And the labor theory of value, value uh, does just the opposite. It doesn't justify the exploitation of workers, it reveals it. And so there became a need for an intellectual response to Marxism. And that's where that, uh, that quote that I had from the founder of the, the first president of the University of Chicago comes in. Uh, that, uh, and, and I think there's a lot of cynicism involved in that that uh, these economists knew that they weren't really telling the truth about what was going on, but they were uh, answering to their paymasters who wanted a new set of uh, a new set of ideologies in order to respond to the rising working class militancy. Um, Christian's question uh, about if exploitation disappeared, uh, then what would be the, the result of it? Uh, that's oversimplification of your question. But I think uh, it's an insufficient question because uh, we're not going to just have socialism and make uh, exploitation disappear overnight. There's a lot of other changes that are going to happen in society and in the economy that are going to happen at the same time. And uh, the fight for economic democracy goes hand in hand and is interlocked with the fight for every other type of democracy, for, uh, for equality, for the abolition of various forms of, uh, of, of discrimination among different groups of people and the abolition of militarism. And all of these things are going to change the way that the entire society functions, not just uh, the relationship between workers and bosses, although that's, of course, very central. But for example, uh, the whole war economy will go away. It will have to go away. And that's going to free up all sorts of resources uh, for, uh, for human needs. There will be uh, the uh, much higher level of uh, cultural values, literacy throughout society that will make it possible to uh, not only have people enjoy life that much more, but make their, make their labor more productive. And hence, it's realistic, I think, even at the present time, it would be realistic to dramatically reduce working hours. Uh, you know, 40 hours a week. I mean, not that most people even get to uh, restrict their work to 40 hours, but uh, 40 hours uh, in light of modern productivity is outrageous. Uh, people shouldn't have to work more than 15, 20 hours a week at the most. And, uh, and the production of things that are detrimental to human existence uh, military in the first place, but all sorts of other things uh, that degrade the environment, that degrade uh, people, uh, the, the cultural industries that, uh, that exploit people uh, based on uh, their sex, based on uh, their race, nationality, all those things, uh, those all will change with the advent of socialism. And uh, that's going to change all of these formulations. So I think when we ask these questions, we shouldn't be modest about it. Uh, the, uh, the coming of socialism to the United States, uh, which isn't just going to happen with a snap of the finger, it's going to be a process and it's going to be something that uh, is going to involve a great deal of struggle and hardship on the part of a lot of people. Uh, not that the existing system doesn't involve hardship. Uh, but all of those things are going, uh, everything is going to change. And uh, we, it's, it's a wonderful thing to look forward to. And we shouldn't limit our vision to uh, just what seems to be right in front of us. We should expand it. Um, so uh, what, by the way, um, since I have the slide up at the present time, I'll mention a, a few words about the other recommended readings. Uh, I mentioned the, uh, 
book with wage labor and capital and value price and profit by Marx. Um, the political economy by John Eaton. John Eaton was a British uh, economist <laughs> who wrote this book, I think in the 1950s. Uh, it was written with a working class audience, uh, progressive uh, trade unionist working class audience in mind. And so it's written in a way that uh, ordinary people, working people, I think, can understand it. And uh, it's also av available through international publishers. Um, it's not completely up to date with everything because it was written over half a century ago, but the essential uh, core of it is still very valid and it has a lot of good formulations that are easier to understand and reading some of this stuff in the original by Marx or Engels, I think. Uh, the, um, the book by Victor Perlow that I quoted on a number of uh, slides in this presentation, Super Profits and Crises, uh, that's also available. It's still in print and it's a bigger book. It's, uh, it's over 500 pages, but there's a lot of meat in here. So if somebody wants to really dig in, um, it's, uh, it's very readable and it's well worth reading. Uh, and then finally, um, no one who is a Marxist should go through their life without reading Lenin's book on imperialism. Uh, it is just a truly remarkable piece of work. It was written uh, during World War I and uh, on, the, on the eve of the Russian Revolution and uh, it is uh, still completely readable and very relevant. Uh, I probably go back and reread it every 10 years or so. And every time I read it, I get new insights and uh, understandings out of it. Uh, it's not very long. It's uh, about, what, 120 pages long, I think. And uh, it's a real description of modern capitalism. It's uh, Karl Marx wrote about capitalism in the 19th century. Lenin wrote about modern capitalism in the 20th century, but uh, most of it is still extremely uh, relevant to the capitalist system today. So let's take a couple more questions. All right. So it looks like we have a few more hands up. Remember to raise your hand uh, so we can call on you. Let us do Beck Madsen. You should be able to speak now. Yes, hi. Um, I'm curious about um, talking about like the rate of surplus value in um, labor organizing versus talking about um, more of a like living wage, like quality of life approach in labor, like activism. And I guess I'm curious, like how you can effectively like um, push for both or like synthesize approaches with both kinds of like information um, because it seems like both are important. Um, I'm not sure if that makes sense, but I'm interested in what you have to say about that. All right, and the next question will come from Delanta. You should be able to speak now. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question was, um, in your experience, how do you approach uh, like talking to workers or people about like these Marx ideas who might otherwise I see hostile to them? Okay. All right. Would you like to address those two first, Carl? And we'll see how much time we have left. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the two questions are actually very similar um, because uh, it's how do you, you know, how do you get this stuff to relate to, uh, uh, to actually uh, using it with workers in the process of organizing them for uh, unions or for you know, for other political purposes. And I, I think the answer is that first of all, 
we have to do a little study ourselves so we understand them, internalize them very well. Uh, because if you just, you know, if, if you take and copy verbatim the stuff that I put on these slides, uh, or take it verbatim out of anything for that matter, and approach workers, uh, you'll just get a blank stare. And uh, or else they'll just think you're an ultra leftist ideologue and um, and you won't have any impact. You really have to develop ways of talking about these things. Um, but I, I think that, for example, the idea of the rate of surplus value, uh, I, I think it's possible to talk to people who are not uh, particularly interested in Marxist uh, ideology or anything, uh, just about uh, this whole concept about how value, you know, the, the idea, first of all, that labor is the source of all value, which is not a, uh, a new idea and certainly uh, shouldn't be uh, perceived by a lot of people as being intrinsically uh, radical and communist. I mean, that, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln said it, so uh, it's, it's an idea that's been around and been very acceptable for a long time. And uh, then it, you have to do a little bit of study about what the value is that is actually added by <laughs> the workers in whatever place you're dealing with. If you're organizing uh, hotel workers, for example. And uh, so the people who make up the rooms and uh, do the cleaning and laundry and things like that. Uh, what, uh, how much value is added by the work that they do and how much do they get back out of it? And I think if you can just uh, present those facts, which should be obtainable, they should be accessible, then that in itself reveals a lot about what's going on. And the goal here, I think, is to help incite a sense of outrage uh, that people are, uh, you know, they may be producing three or four dollars of value and only getting one dollar back. So it's not just that they're underpaid in term, in absolute terms, that they're forced to get by on, you know, the twenty dollars an hour, let's say, when uh, the minimal uh, amount that's needed to maintain a family is much, much higher than that. Uh, but it's also a matter that uh, it could be a lot higher. Uh, if they actually were compensated in line with the value that they produce. And I think that's a conversation you can have, have with people. And it doesn't mean that you have to go around, uh, uh, I mean, it's great if you can get people to read uh, uh, Wage, Labor, and Capital or Value, Price, and Profit, uh, but uh, it's not necessary to do that. I think you can just explain this concept and uh, help. and. But first of all, you have to internalize it yourself and make sure that you understand yourself what it is and what it means, and then do a little research to find out how it applies in the particular industry that you're working in. And um, and so in terms of the other questions about how do you approach workers with these ideas, again, uh, you have to start by understanding the ideas yourself. And uh, and one of the real challenges with being a, uh, a revolutionary and a communist is learning how to talk with people uh, in a language that can be generally understood and not falling into the use of jargon, uh, which is, uh, is a shortcut and a lot of times reveals, I think, <laughs> Uh, that the person who's using that jargon hasn't really internalized the meaning of the terms that they're using. Uh, because if you really internalize it, then you will find ways of uh, expressing it in different terms that are uh, more familiar with people and uh, more familiar to people and that uh, communicates the ideas real well. So, so I think, uh, and then, you know, the other thing is uh, practice. Um, I, I went, I was for 12 years, I was the uh, president of a fairly large union local. And a lot of my job uh, entailed explaining things to people. I was in the utility industry and this was a time when deregulation was going on and 
uh, a lot of stuff that people weren't familiar with, but it was very, very important to us. And as it happened, I had a really long commute every day. I had a, uh, I live in Southern California and I had to commute nearly two hours every day. And so I spent a lot of time just sitting in the car and I would go uh, walk myself in my head through different presentations that I planned to give at union meetings, explaining concepts to people. And it was very useful. It was very helpful because uh, I, I would just go over in my head about how can you take this complex idea that people are not familiar with and break it down so that it's understandable. And I think that's something that all of us should work on, uh, not memorizing the jargon and making sure that our, you know, that when we make a statement that it's completely uh, uh, in line with what, how Marx said it or how Len, Lenin said it, but it has to be something that can be understood by, by the people that you're discussing it with. Okay. Uh, any more? Do we, if we have any time for any more questions, uh, that's fine, or we can wrap it up soon if you'd like. Okay, if I may? Yes, you may. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we should wrap it up. Everyone know that this is part one. Part two of this class will happen on Thursday night, this Thursday night, uh, from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern. Carl, um, are you, is something clicking on your end? Um, is there a noise coming from your end? There might have been, it's just, I, I've been nervously playing with my pen here, so maybe that's the click. Yeah, so, so, so on Thursday, could you uh, find I'll something? Find to play with? Because it'll, it'll mess up your recording, but anyway. All right, so thank you everyone. Thank you, Carl, and we hope you're able to join us Thursday night for uh, information that you're not going to get in many other places. So please do join us again and invite others uh, to join us uh, as well. So uh, thank you, Kay, uh, moderating tonight. Thank you, Carl, again. And we hope to see everyone Thursday night. Okay? All right. Good night.